meeting started. Give me one second. All right, I'm ready to go. We're starting in 15 seconds. Good afternoon, good evening at this point. Uh, my name is Treyon White. I serve as the council member of the Great Ward 8. Um, tonight we're having a unique discussion about budget. Um, I always believe that where your heart is that your treasure will be also. Um, DC has grown tremendously financially um, and we are at a place in time where we are in the middle of a pandemic and we've even watched the city prosper during a pandemic but most jurisdictions and cities are struggling financially. Um, and I wanna thank uh, our government partners who are on the, on the Zoom today, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, I do this every year in hopes to uh, educate and inform residents about the budget process and also allow them to participate. I always say that when you're not at the table, you're on, your, you're on the menu. And I learned that from William Lockridge. And so it's our job to advocate, get the right information, um, figure out what it is we need and demand what we need and organize. We can always talk about what we disagree on, but at some point we have to figure out what we can agree on. We have passed the conversation about equality and our conversations have been about equity. Um, we need more in different areas because traditionally and historically we've had less. Um, and so today uh, we will start a discussion uh, with residents um, to, uh, about our priorities. Uh, last week, the council received an annual comprehensive financial report. And this report gives a review of the district's financial health. It was reported that DC, that DC's economy uh, continue to recover, but at, at a pace slightly below the national average. It will likely take until FY 2023 for employment to return to pre-pandemic levels. However, DC's unemployment rate as of September, 2021 was 6.6% down from 2.1% points from the revised seasonal adjusted rate of 8.7% reported a year earlier. However, we know that Ward 8, we still are impacted with higher unemployment rates. And please know that unemployment rate is only calculated by those who are actively uh, seeking employment, especially through Department of Employment Services. We need to discuss that when the city's taxes increase by 16.4%, real property taxes increase by 2.7%. I know because I'm a homeowner and I remember looking at my uh, tax assessment and it was requiring me to pay an extra 300, roughly $300 a month. And that's a lot, um, you know, for any person to add an extra $300 to their bills. Um, and then there are residents who may not have that. And so we're working to create avenues that people can live here, stay here and grow their families here in the District of Columbia. Um, while the city is prospering, everybody don't feel that's pro that prosperity. And so it's about us uniting and participating. Um, so we went from a surplus. We, so we want to hear from you on how a surplus of $283.2 million to the Housing Production Trust Fund for affordable housing and an additional $283.2 million for PAYGO, uh, which is the Capital Fund for Infrastructure, can benefit the residents of Ward 8 and across the city. Each year after hearing from residents, I take the information you all provide me and craft a budget of priorities. Um, I meet with executive and I meet with each council member individually, including our chairman, Phil Mendelson, who will join us tonight as we talk about um, public safety, education, economic empowerment, affordable housing, home ownership, youth services, senior services, and just a high quality of living here in Ward 8. And each year I take that list and I meet with the mayor, uh, the city administrator, and also uh, John Felcheckio from Dempid, and we discuss our priorities. We figure out what we have in common, don't have in common, we pretty much work from there. I also meet with every council member because just because um, they may be the council member for Ward 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, um, doesn't mean they don't chair a committee that affects directly resources um, that affect Ward 8. And so we go through these things, we uh, fight scratch 
to get some of the things we need. So over the years, we've got things like four new recreation centers in the pipeline to be built in Ward 8. Uh, one just got finished in Furby Hope. Uh, uh, we have one coming to Anacostia in the back of Ketchum. We have uh, one coming to uh, Douglas uh, in the Henson Ridge community, um, and one coming to Congress Heights in the Congress Heights community. And we're looking to do more. We funded in the budget um, with the help of Mayor Maria Bowser, a new senior living, a senior, a senior wellness center. We helped to subsidize the new uh, Good Food Market grocery store located on South Cap and Atlantic Street. We put money into youth violence prevention. Uh, when I got in office, I used to always talk about the violence in the community. And the narrative then was crime was down. And as Phil Pinnell would say, yeah, crime is down, down the street, uh, around the corner in our communities. And so we fought to get money in the budget to uh, fund programs, individuals, organizations that get money in the streets so we can help deter the crime. Uh, unfortunately, we're, we are not doing enough and we're just scratching the surface. Even today, uh, I just read uh, about the, the, the person shot at H.D. Woodson. And two days ago, I was at Kramer Middle School meeting with some of the young men there about some stuff stirring in the school. And two hours later, another young person, 14-year-old boy was shot uh, who attended Kramer that wasn't in school that day. Um, and so we are concerned about how the budget influences policy and also uh, deters crime and also gives us a better quality of living. Um, and so we are proactive um, in some cases, in some cases we are reactive, but it's imperative that we have a shared agenda to demand what we need in our ward um, and make that known with $17.5 billion. And when I first got in office, as Jen knows, the budget was what, 14.5 billion and we've grown 3 billion in uh, four and a half, five years. And so we are growing as a city. So we wanna make sure those funds are reflected into helping people uh, in, be included, not with a handout, but with a hand up. And it's about priorities and it's about big vision. And so I wanna pause for a moment because we are joined tonight with some very special guests tonight. Um, I, I'm sure if the chairman has joined us yet, he has not joined us yet, but he should be joining us momentarily. He was going to be a little bit late. Okay. That's okay. I see we got David Umansky from the Office of Chief Financial Office. And we have the acting director, uh, Fitzroy, Fitz, Fitzroy Lee, joining us tonight. You got some VIPs in the house that are experts um, in financing and addressing uh, our questions and concerns about the DC budget. We'll also be joined later on. Uh, by the budget director, Jim Budov. And so I'm gonna pause for a moment uh, because we have a pre presentation by Mr. Lee, who is the acting chief financial officer of the government of the District of Columbia. So Mr. Lee, introduce yourself and take us away. Um, thank you, council member. Um, and yeah, I, I'll start off with um, just a quick background. So, you know, I, I am the, as council member White said, I'm the, Acting Chief Financial Officer, and I've been um, in the OCFO for 20 years and started as the Director of Revenue Estimation, did the revenue estimate that is the basis for the budget and financial plan. And from that, I became the Deputy CFO and Chief Economist for the Office of Revenue Analysis. And since last March, I've been the Acting CFO. And so what I wanna do is um, give a summary and Council Member White already mentioned some of the highlights of our annual comprehensive financial report, but I just wanna, you know, yeah, it's a short presentation and the salient or the highlights from that report and a little about the fund balance. Um, and then I will just give a short overview of the core functions of the CFO and the CFO's um, role in the budget process. So with that, let me share my screen. Okay, here we go. So everybody can see the, Screen. 
All right, if everybody can see the screen, I'll start up. So um, this, um, so in the annual comprehensive financial report that we presented to the council last week, um, we have the financial report at a clean audit opinion with a surplus. And this is the 25th consecutive year that we have had a clean audit opinion. And we put that there because, um, you know, in the late 1990s, we actually had trouble um, producing uh, annual financial report, and which was the reason we had then uh, control board, one of the reasons I should say. And so we have a 25th consecutive year, um, you know, where we have, you know, uh, there are no control board and we have been producing these um, clean audits. We also, for the seventh consecutive year, we have a report that has no material weakness or no significant deficiencies. Um, our pension and retiree healthcare trusts are remain fully funded with uh, actually an increase because these funds depend a lot on the financial markets performance. And so it's actually a good position. And I want to say here that this is something that is unique amongst um, municipal jurisdiction where many, many jurisdictions are struggling with trying to fund, um, fully fund their pension funds. And so this is something that, um, in fact, um, yesterday I saw a report that's put out by um, an organization called Truth in Accounting, where the district actually was rated number one in terms of strong financial position. And part of uh, one of the big reasons for this was because of they're one of the only jurisdiction that has fully funded their pension funds. Um, and then we I'll talk about this in a minute. We have fully funded locally and federal and local mandated reserve. Those have been fully funded by the surplus. And then of course, um, we continue to have strong ratings on our general obligation bonds. So the general obligation bonds are the bonds that are funded by the general revenue. And you know we make reserve mainly from the real property tax. And we also have an income tax bond that is backed by our income tax revenue. And both of those um, from at least one ratings agency, they have a AAA rating. So um, as the council member said earlier, um, in spite of the, the um, this economic disruption of the pandemic, the district um, remains financially strong. So I talked about the reserve and, um, you know, with the reserve, the, the surplus that we generated in last year's, we were able to increase our fund balance from about 3.3 billion last year and it's now 3.6 billion. And just, uh, I'll take some time to say where, where those money ends up in the fund balance. So on this, on this side here, um, as you'll see, um, we have, we have, um, sorry, go back. Yeah, on this side, this right-hand side, we have um, what we call our working capital and one, Part of that is federally mandated reserve, we call the emergency and contingency fund. Then there are two locally mandated reserve, the fiscal stabilization fund and the cash flow reserve. And together, those are constitute about 16 and two thirds of the overall expenditure budget. And these are reserved to help in the time of emergency and um, just in the day-to-day -day operations of the city where um, if you think about how, how the cities run, we are not always matching what we need to spend with revenues that come in. So the revenue coming in can be lumpy. So we get big infusion of revenues in, in uh, March when our real property tax are due. And then again in April when our income tax collections are due. And then again, an another big infusion in September when the second half of the property tax payment is due. But during that time, we do have expenses that are going. So the, none of the, neither the inflows nor the outflows are smooth. 
what this cash allow us to do is to continue funding um, the government in times when we don't have cash. And so in the past, what we would do is go out and borrow money in order to fund our day-to-day -day operations. And they call these tax revenue anticipation notes. And you know, as you know, when we borrow money, we have to pay it back and pay it with interest. And not only that, borrowing money also have costs. If you, you know, you know, when you if you think about buying a house, which is borrowing money and you have to pay these um, closing costs, the same thing goes when we borrow money for municipal. So it takes away some of the resources that we would otherwise be spending on the highest priorities. So having this two months of cash is something that helps us in the day-to-day -day operations. And then I want to, during the, during the pandemic, there were, you know, as you know, during the pandemic, we had lots of needs. And we had to draw on these reserves in that emergency to keep um, to spend on unanticipated needs that arose during the pandemic. So these are very these these reserves, as you know, we built over the last several years, and it has been important in terms of running the district and allowing us to manage through crisis. Um, the other pieces of it, these are what mostly what we call O type balances. So some agencies are funded by certain revenue um, sources. And whenever they spend less, less than spend less than a revenue come, they end up in these balances. And then um, we also have we sometimes make reservations for spending um, funding that's coming in in a current year. We make plans to spend it in subsequent years. And then of course Whenever you borrow money, they, you know, it's almost like collateral. They want you to reserve a certain amount of cash, and that's in this part. And then the council member make reference by district law, anything is left over after we fill all these other reserves. 50% goes into um, PAYGO or PAYGO capital for capital expenditures, and 50% goes into the housing production trust fund, which is used to. Um, help in build um, more affordable housing because as you know you know the district um, is one amongst many city that has very expensive housing and this year and the council member mentioned that as well we were able to put 283.2 million in pago capital and 283.2 million in housing production trust fund so this, you know, we, the surplus has been already distributed by federal and district law, and then by obligations that we have um, in, in the case of, say, the debt service into all of these different parts. So just a, a, a quick um, overview of what the, the functions of the independent chief financial officer. So one of the things that we do, and I'll talk about that in, in the next slide, is certify that budgets are balanced and financial statements are fairly represented. And for that part, we hire an external auditor. So the report that I just mentioned, the annual comprehensive financial report was reviewed by an external auditor to say that all the financial, the financial statements are a fair represented, um, fairly fair representation of the district's um, financial position. We also provide revenue estimates that are the basis for the basis for the budget and financial plan. We monitor on an ongoing basis revenue and spending, and we would alert the mayor and the council no, if, no, if no, something no. happens. Something happens that put that. Um, cause either a shortfall in revenues or increases in spending. And any legislation from the mayor or the council, we evaluate them to make sure that they don't put our budget and financial plan out of balance. We review um, economic development projects to make sure that the funding, is, the funding for those projects are sustainable. And we issue debt, manage all investment, and oversee the credit ratings. And one of the big functions and you know, a, a large part of the staff of the OCFO is employed in the Office of Tax and Revenue that does the tax collection. And we also manage the lottery. And finally, um, and, but very importantly, um, each agency in the government 
as financial personnel that does the budget, the accounting, and all the other um, uh, um, pay, um, financial functions in those agencies. So it's a, it's a broad scope in terms of what the financial officer, um, the office of the chief financial officer does. And then finally, I just wanted to, because I know we're right at the beginning of the start of the budget season, actually in some quarters it has already um, started. And I just wanted to give an overview um, with some emphasis as to the CFO's role in that process. So, you know, it starts off and the, the Office of Budget and Planning, which is an agency under the CFO, does prepares what is called a current services funding level budget. So if you're not looking at any policy proposal, this budget tells you what, what the level of spending would be if you're just spending with some adjustments for inflation and so on, and so on for the next fiscal year. And then at the end of this month, the, we will prepare an annual revenue estimate for the mayor's budget, and that will kick off the but with that. So one of in the in the Home Rule Act, um, the district is not allowed to spend above what that revenue estimate, and hence our balanced budget. Then the mayor prepares the annual budget. Um, the CFO has a role there to certify that the budget um, and the financial plan is balanced. Then the mayor submits the budget and financial plan to the council. Um, and that date is set by council resolution, so it is already known. And then the council has 56 days to hold public hearings and adopt a uh, budget. Um, and then the council has 30 days to override the veto if, the, if it is vetoed. If the veto is sustained, then the mayor submits the budget with the requested changes to the president and the Congress. And if the mayor does a high um, line item veto, he or she must attach the act and the statement of the disapproved item and return to the council. Then the mayor has 10 business days to sign and submit to the president and Congress. And, you know, before um, another certificate, so before all, all of that happens, there's a CFO certification process. So when the council, when the council finished the budget, we have to certify that as well. So, um, that is just a, a quick run through as to the budget um, process and then the, the items in yellow are the CFO's um, role in that budget. Uh, mostly it is providing um, revenue estimates and then certifying that the budget is balanced and then the rest is um, the policy decisions that both the mayor and the council has to make. So with that, I am available for any questions. Um, and I don't know if you're gonna do it now or after the chairman has presented. So Director Lee, we're gonna come back to you. Uh, we wanna thank you okay. for that very informative presentation. It helps us to understand um, how the government works, and how, uh, you know what they say, show me the money. <laughs> and to figure out wh wh where's all this money going in that process. And so you're showing us the budget process, which we greatly appreciate. Um, I think you still have your PowerPoint up. Yeah, I'm trying to find how to punch here. I don't see the button to stop sharing. Okay. We can probably try to figure it out on our end. I think one of us causes of that. Yeah, let me look and see. Get transferred to Jen. Let's see. So we'll take a few questions in a moment. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat or in the question and answer so we can be um, sifting through those while the presentation is going on so we can better give an accurate answer to your question. Um, and if you're on social media, you can put them in the chat on social media and Jews will take them and type them in the chat so the panelists can see them and give an adequate answer to your question. And if you have budget suggestions, um, you can put them in the chat as well. Um, and, and or, uh, we get further instructions at the end, but we want to take suggestions about budget request items 
for our list. Um, we'll gather those in a moment. Um, you can send them to my email, which is twhite at dccouncil.us, twhite at dccouncil.us. I do not see any hands up for questions. I don't know if there are any questions from Facebook. No, Wanda, we're not going. We're not going to take questions at the moment. We're going to take questions at the at the next presentation. Okay. Hold on a second. Is the chairman coming yet? I don't know. I don't think I see the chairman just yet, but. We, we have someone that's better than the chairman. I'll let the chairman know I said that. Um, and that and that's our, our secret weapon. And that's Ms. Jennifer Jen Budolf, who's the budget director of the Council of DC, Washington, DC. Uh, uh, we were, Jen and I was talking and she was at the budget conversation um, was it yesterday yesterday morning. Um, and, it, and, and we have um, situation where the council have access money or surpluses or reserve money is always a back and forth about what's priority and how do we restructure that priority to what uh, to put the money where because it's 13 members and some of us agree on some things um, but you know it's a matter how where to put it and where and we still have to negotiate with the executive because they are in turn sending us over a balanced budget, but I'll let Jen um, speak to that. And we thank you for having, I'm thankful for having you tonight, Jen. I know you're very busy. I know you had a long day, um, but we're grateful to have you. You can get started when you, when you. Oh, thank you so much, Council Member White. And thank you for inviting me here. I'm really excited to um, come out and talk to the community about the budget. I love talking about the budget. So feel free, <laughs> I, I saw that eye roll. But, um, uh, you know, I, what I want to do is I want to talk about, um, you know, just some general budget concepts and some high level things. So um, that when, you know, the community, you advocate, you know, for your community, for your family, for your ward, you'll be able to advocate more effectively um, with regard to the budget. My role, I'm the budget director for the council. So I work for all 13 members and I have a team that works with me and our job is to help all of the council members out throughout the year and during the budget season, um, help formulate budget and um, uh, help sort of actualize what the council members and what their constituents want to see in the final document. I'm going to share my screen. Um, can, can everyone see the uh, PowerPoint? Fantastic. Okay. So what is the budget? In the most basic terms, the budget is DC's spending plan for the fiscal year. It's what we're spending our money on and what type of money we're using to pay for that spending. So what are we spending our money on? Are we spending it on schools? Are we spending it on uh, training programs? And then what type of money are we using for that spending? Are we using our local funds like our sales tax revenue or our income tax revenue? Or are we using the federal money that, we, that the district received from all of the COVID stimulus bills? Um, you know, in a nutshell, that's the budget. Now, the budget itself is split into sort of two distinct sides. And it's important to understand the distinction between the two sides. What we normally talk about is the operating budget. And that is the money, the funding necessary to keep the government running day to day. <clears throat> that's the money for the people, for the programs, things like that. Now the capital budget is, is funded with a different type of money and it's used to build and renovate all of the district's long-term assets. So the capital budget is what pays for 
schools, rec centers, roads, those types of things. So when we talk about the budget, we're really talking about two, two distinct sides, the operating budget and the capital budget. Now, what do we spend all of this money on? I know the council member talked before about how much the budget has grown over the past five or six years. And it is really astounding. And I'm sure um, Fitzroy, when he joined the district 20 years ago as the chief revenue estimator, I, 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 I wonder what the, um, the district's revenue levels were back then. But we have a budget, uh, gross revenue <coughs> from all sources of $18.4 billion. It's a lot of money. Um, and this sort of, this shows where we spend the money. Where do we spend the money? Well, we spend about half of our money on human support services and schools. <coughs> human support services is, you know, housing, um, jobs programs, Medicaid programs like that. Medicaid is actually the district's largest program. It's over $3 billion. Um, then we have our schools. We spend about a billion dollars on DCPS. We spend about a billion dollars on the charters um, and then money on lots of other things. And then the other half of our budget is spent on, you know, a lot of the things that you think of as like, you know, the normal regular government services like MPD, um, DPW, <coughs> uh, just the regular operations of the government. Seems like the pace act has. Act. So, yeah, Fitzroy good. talked about this a little bit, but there are there are three entities in the district that have very distinct roles in the budget process, and different different entities have are sort oh. of the headliner at different times of the year. Say that again. So. There's the mayor, there's the council, and there's the chief financial officer. Say that so again. For the mayor, um, you know, they are required to submit a balance. She is required to submit a balanced budget to the council. Once we get that budget, um, we have 70 days to pass it. We hold hearings. Um, council members listen to their constituents. Um, we make a number of changes, and then we pass a revised budget. Now, all of these changes that we make, Dr. Lee Fitzroy needs to tell us that it's balanced, because if it's not balanced, we can't move forward with it. So the third distinct entity is the chief financial officer. And the chief financial officer, Fitzroy, went through all of the things that they do, but in terms of the budget process, um, I view their main job as making sure that the council and the mayor pass a balanced budget. We don't spend more money than we have. Um, so there's that. Now, you know, we, uh, Council Member White has his budget for him uh, because we, the Council is receiving the budget in five weeks, which is insane. Um, we are receiving the budget on March 16th. Um, and then the council has their first big hearing on March 18th, where the mayor and the CFO brief the council on everything that's in the budget. And then we go straight into all of our hearings. And um, this is when you know all the different committees hold hearings on the agencies within their purview, learn about what their budget, what's in their budget. We start getting a sense of what the community is happy with and items that the community may not be happy with and items that need to be changed. Those items are reflected in the committee markups and those that happens on April 20th through 21st. Um, and then once the committees mark up their budgets, it, the budget comes to my office, the Office of the Budget Director, and we work on pulling all of the um, recommendations together into a balanced budget. 
and then do a number of council-wide priorities or fund a number of council-wide priorities that are kind of too big to happen or in the individual committee process. Um, and then we vote. We're voting on May 10th and May 24th this year, um, which is uh, fantastic. I'm excited to have it, uh, the second vote be before Memorial Day. Um, and you can, if you want to sign up to testify or you want to see when the hearings are, um, you can go to the council's website, um, dccouncil.us. Um, and I'm sure Council Member White has a lot of really good information out there as well um, to, um, you know, see when the hearings are and if you want to sign up to testify. Uh, whoops, wrong screen. Okay, so how do you get involved? Like what I was just talking about, testify at the agency performance hearings. Those are the ones that are happening right now. Um, for the budget, um, you know, the first place to go to is, you know, to the executive because they are the entity that is charged with basically doing the first draft on the budget, pulling it together, saying this is what I want the budget to be. And you advocate with the mayor. Hopefully it is incorporated into the budget that she sends to the council. Once we get it, um, you know, you can request a meeting with um, with your council member. Um, you can participate in a ward budget forum, such as the one that you guys are all listening to now. Um, testify at a hearing, um, you know, run after council member White on the street and say, hey, council member, I really think uh, we need to fund this or that. And, um, and finally, you know, all of our budget hearings, the budget testifying of the budget hearings is a great way of getting your voice heard. Um, you know, not just, um, sorry. <laughs> uh, not just, um, you know, to the um, committee itself, but to the wider audience who, who pays attention to these hearings. Um, this is just a little plug that there's a lot of information that you can find on my office's website, which is dccouncilbudget.com. You can find all of the budget documents, fiscal impact statements, um, presentations, primers on how the budget works. Um, we do a lot of uh, policy and economic research. You can find that there. And we also have some really cool um, interactive tools. Um, we have a dashboard where you can look up the budget for you know, any program and any agency. Um, that's up there as well. So um, with that, uh, I just have, you know, I'll send this presentation over to the council members. So you know, they'll have it. This is just my, um, my team and all of our contact information. But, um, you know, that is, let's see. Let's see. Okay. And um, that's pretty much it. And, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions or, you know, provide any information that, um, you know, is of interest. So thank you. Thank you, and I appreciate that. And I do want to note that we also joined by our State Board of Education Rep, uh, Dr. Colleen Reed. If she can, if we can elevate her to the panel, um, she has some comments and suggestions of our education. And I do remember one year, uh, our schools were underfunded in Ward Eight by almost fifteen million dollars, and some at at and some representatives coming from the community came and testified and we ended up restoring that funding. Mm -hmm. and, and there were some suggestions were here about supporting uh, minority businesses in DC. And I created what is now called the mm -hmm. Dream Grant. Mm -hmm. That's in the budget now where we give grants from DSLBD to minority businesses in War 7 and 8. So that yep. came out of these discussions. Absolutely. And so I wanna thank you, Dr. Reed. Thank you for that beautiful presentation, Dr. Director Budolf. Um, Dr. Reed, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks for joining us. 
Thank you, Councilmember White, um, for one, hosting this opportunity as you usually do, um, and then for reaching out and offering um, the ability to just quickly speak about education. Um, greatly appreciate it. I know anytime I text, usually your office is like, we already know it, um, and just great to have your partnership in education. Um, I know there's a lot of advocates and community members who are fired up and ready to go related to the budget in DC. So I wanted to raise a couple points that as Ward 8 members are um, showing up to other council members or into hearings, um, how they can advocate in regards to our schools. Um, currently only about 43% of our Ward 8 schools have a full modernization. Um, there was an act that was put in place called the PACE Act, which was supposed to provide some equality in um, renovations, uh, but actually almost feels like some of those renovations has slowed down for us. So now we have certain wards, and I hate clicking on Ward 3, but it is fact that Ward 3 has full modernizations for their, I think, 12 or 13 uh, DC public schools. However, we only have 43% of our DC public schools that have received full modernization. So that is something I hope Ward A members can take and run to council um, to ask for equity, meaning we need more because we have been systemically shut out. Um, and how can we rectify some of these differences? Um, and speed up modernization in our schools. Um, I know Johnson Middle School is um, Council Member White knows, um, you know, has a whole floor that cannot be accessed right now uh, because of it needs renovations. Um, and I know their parent teacher organization is fighting hard to, um, you know, advocate around this. I know we have a lot of uh, Johnson alumni uh, who uh, are in our ward um, who would love to see these renovations. I've even talked to an alum who went all the way back to saying when he was there in 1950s, it almost looks like the same sort of building. Um, so that's the area for us to fight for. Um, also, Johnson Middle School has award-winning sports. Um, they knock it out the park in every um, aspect of their sports program, and not just about the athletics, but they really create young people who have character. Currently, there are no lights on Johnson Middle School's field. They rely on the um, DC police to light their field. Surely we can give these athletes um, the quality facilities that they deserve so that they can practice um, because they already show the skill to do it, uh, but we can reward their, their athletics with um, you know, the funds for quality lighting. Um, I also raised, and there's a lot of need uh, in the war, MLK Elementary is to the point now that they want to raise $12,000 from their parents to get smart boards. So that's something our parents shouldn't be required to do. That's something that, uh, you know, us as residents as DC and this $3 billion budget can surely make sure that MLK Elementary School has smart boards for the students to have state-of-the-art education experiences. Um, lastly, I'll raise, and I, we, have, uh, we have about 40 almost some odd schools in Ward 8, so I don't want to have faith favorites, but I'll raise Excel Academy. I appreciate Council Member White and other council members for helping get the um, buy out the lease for Excel so the little girls would not have to uh, move buildings or anything like that a couple of business or um, financial cycles ago, but there still needs that state of the art reservation. There's an all boys school, Ron Brown. Surely we can get our all girls school entity, uh, Excel Academy that's in housing ward eight, um, that same level of state of the art uh, facility so that they can have their dance program that is pretty well known in other uh, aspects of their program that can be um, supplemented. So I, Ward 8, you know, I know y'all are always fired up and ready to go. These are just some of the issues related to education. I'll put my information in the chat. Um, if there's other issues um, that you want to raise, um, but surely we can get behind these few examples of getting an equitable budget related to our schooling that our, our students must deserve. And again, thank you, Councilmember White. Thank you to your staff, uh, Ms. Wanda and Ms. Wendy. You are always on the line uh, responding to any letters or requests that I have. So I, I greatly appreciate your partnership in this work. Thank you. And I, I'll give a first stab at it. And I guess they can add to it. I thank you for that information. Um, one of the things I know we've done in the past was reach out um, to the mayor, uh, the then deputy mayor for education and the chancellor's office and, D and really DGS. Um, that's really where a lot of our, uh, our renovations get stuck in our request for proposal um, in the different phases. And so I, I just remember last year, um, we had moved money around to put additional million dollars into Johnson, but that's a drop in the bucket when we talk about the real need, uh, the, the real uh, money that's needed 
to get it where it needs to be. And it's really about equity. So I wanna thank you, Dr. Reed. We will add some of this um, to our list. Some of this may already be on there with our schools. Um, and I know that schools have also sent in um, requests, some of the communities around recreation centers, uh, some of the requests for lighting or speed bumps. Uh, we've been getting a number of those and and there's requests as well, some um, need for after school programs and uh, before care and after care. Um, we actually, uh, so that was one of our requests we submitted this week to council member Silverman um, for year round services for after school and also uh, year round jobs that extend beyond summer jobs. So some of this stuff uh, we have already started churning the wheels with, with my colleagues on the council anticipating the budget from the mayor's office. Um, and so I do thank you for that. And there's probably a lot more on the list um, that we can address. So I wanna thank you for that. We are now joined by our chairman, Alicia Henry, and our chairman, Phil, Phil Mendelson, <laughs> who has to get his name fixed. If somebody can help him out, we appreciate that. Um, I'm changing it now. Thank you, um, who's joined us um, and Council Member Mendelson know that he and I meet pretty much every year, several times a year about the budget, um, about what's a priority, how can we get this to happen here? And I remember he even came to the ward one year at the Rise Center when we were fighting to get the DC Infrastructure Academy here in Ward 8. I think that was about 17 million at the, t at the time. Um, and now we have it at, um, in Ward 8 on Pomeroy Road at Wilkerson Elementary School. Um, when it wasn't there before to provide job and career training. And then we, since then we graduated people that's in Pepco working full-time jobs in other industry and solar panel industry and, other, and elsewhere. Um, so I wanna thank you chairman for that. Um, we can send, consider you a friend of Ward 8 um, and hopefully you can get some things accomplished in the budget. Chairman, you can talk about a little bit what you do and what you do with the budget. Sure, thank you. Um, so I'm sorry I'm late, so I have no idea what others have said. So I'm gonna, I guess, stick to what you just suggested, which is uh, my role with the government, with the budget. Uh, so we're expecting the budget to come to us March 16th. And each of the committees will look at their uh, agencies under the, the, the agencies are under their purview and make recommendations to the committee as a whole. The budget and all of the related documents are referred to the committee as a whole, which I chair. And so the committees give recommendations. And I would say that maybe 99% of the recommendations from the committees are what are in the final proposal that's put before the full council. Where there's a variance, it's usually where there's some, either mathematically it doesn't work, it's not balanced, or there's not support from a majority of the council members. So pretty much, what the committees recommend is what uh, goes, in the goes into the budget. I look at all the committee recommendations. The council members sit down, a uh, working meeting. Um, in the last couple of years, it's been virtual. In the past, we were all crowded into a small room, which is what we will do when we're back in person and uh, go through all of it. Uh, there's actually quite a bit of balancing work that's necessary, but also I try to do my own job at scrubbing the budget. And uh, because of that, usually I'm able to help with some additional requests from members. So Council Member White, when you come to me and you say, hey, um, there was uh, some improvement at um, Bald Eagle Rec Center that was overlooked. Can we find another million dollars for it? Um, I can't say I'm always able to say yes, but usually I'm able to uh, help. And all that goes into the final proposal that gets put before the council. Council votes twice now because we have budget autonomy. And uh, most, of the, uh, most of the focus and debate is over the first vote because that's really where everything is new and uh, things are still getting worked out. Um, I don't remember the dates offhand. I think we vote uh, both votes. Both votes will be in May, um, like the middle of May and the end of May. 
Um, so again, my role is just kind of as chair of the council and chair of the committee as a whole, taking all the recommendations from the different committees, putting them together, reconciling where there are differences, reconciling where there are disagreements, and then trying to help out uh, where uh, there's still some need. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, and we look forward to following up uh, with our Ward 8, Ward 8 list that we are um, drafting and, final and finalizing um, to first, we, as you know, we meet with the mayor then we come to the council and you, I want to thank you, Chairman. So we're going to take questions. Yeah. Uh, Wanda or Jules, if you can help us facilitate the questions or comments from the audience. Um, there is one question in the chat. And this is from James Earl. Is there any kind of equity assessment that breaks down revenue from each ward and spending for each ward by department or agency? Not everyone at once. I, I, <laughs> I guess I can take that one. And the, the answer is no, partly because um, so most most of the revenues that come in come in broadly so income tax revenue and we do produce some map that show generally where the income tax revenue comes from the sales tax revenue is a little more challenging because you know the addresses that we have on our records um are filed by headquarters and you know a file a filing may come from yeah, I'll take the, the example, Starbucks, and it's one filing for all their franchises. So you wouldn't know where, you know, what location in the district that revenue stream has come from. Come from. But generally only the, only the income and property taxes are, you know, available to be broken. And we do publish the, the real property taxes. Um, we do, um, we show the assessment by ward. I, and, and we do it by as um, neighborhood as well. Um, if I may, there is better information on the um, capital budget than there is on the operating budget. So when we, when the council receives the um, budget from the executive, we go through the capital budget and we assign a ward to every project. And then we share that information with each ward-based council member. Um, so we'll be doing that again. Um, and, uh, you know, and it, it shows, you know, how much money is being spent on schools or rec centers or whatever per ward. Now the CFO's office used to do a phenomenal study on um, economic development spending in the in the district and that the spending itself was broken down by ward i don't know if that has been updated recently um but that is a that's a great resource at least on the spending side um you know as as you know dr lee said it's it's kind of for some of the taxes at least it's it's pretty difficult to um you know break it down where where each comes from and it looks like Chairman Mendelson has something to say. I might. I thought the question had to do with expenditures, not revenues. I um, think it was both. I well, heard both. Yeah. In so, the chat, yeah. Yeah, there's not a good breakdown on expenditures. Except, and Jen noted this in the capital budget. For example, uh, alleys. There's a line for street and alley improvements. Maybe it's just alleys. And um, that is broken down by ward. And if I remember correctly, the allocation is equal among the wards. Um, so you will see, and then if somebody wants to figure out schools, look at the schools in the capital budget and figure out, uh, we know that initially when all the school modernizations were being done, there seemed to be less east of the river than west. Uh, I think that has changed. And in fact, we're using a formula now that didn't exist in the past. It is kind of complicated, but deals with um, when the school was last renovated and um, I think enrollment, and there's several factors that go into the ranking of the school. 
But um, there is this with regard to um, spending. Uh, we spend 20% of our local funds on human support services. We spend 27 point, almost 28% of our budget on public education. We spend 13 and a half percent of our budget, this is local funds on public safety and justice. Um, and uh, so think about where most of the schools are. That's the bulk of the public education. Uh, think about where most of the human support services are. That's the bulk of that funding. Those two categories by themselves are 57, almost 58% of our budget. Um, so that, that's not uh, as specific as the questioner was asking, but it does give some sense of where money goes. We have and Chairman, can you speak to, we, we, I know we commissioned an uh, equity study on the council. Um, can you speak to that and how that affects the budget? Well, I think what you're referring to is that we now, under our rules, we do a racial equity impact assessment on every bill. The budget is actually exempt from that project process. And that's because the budget is so complicated that um, it wouldn't work to be doing a um, racial equity impact analysis. But on other legislation, there is. And um, I would say so far it's achieving its number one purpose, which is to get the council members thinking more about equity in the decisions that they're making. Equity is not always an easy answer in the sense that, um, I'll give the example of uh, tobacco. Do we, uh, a tax on tobacco is regressive. Um, so it kind of hurts lower income people the most to increase the tax. On the other hand, tax reduces tobacco consumption which um, statistically would benefit uh, minorities, minority communities, lower income communities more. So which is the more equitable? The regressive tax or reducing uh, improving public health? Um, and that's what I meant when I said sometimes the equity, it's important to think about it, but the answer isn't always uh, cut and dry. Yeah, and I, I do wanna also say that uh, sometimes these bills who, which have to be seen through equity lens have a uh, fiscal impact that requires to be funded, requires to fund the bill. And so maybe not directly, but indirectly, it does affect uh, or can uh, have budget implications based on what bills we pass uh, looking through an equity lens. One of you have any more questions? Yes, um, James asks, does the, does the district still have a triple A bond rating on Wall Street? The answer is yes. So um, as I mentioned in the presentation, we have generally um, our debt um, is from two instruments. One is a general obligation bond, which is funded by the all revenue sources in the district. And we all, it's backed by all the revenue sources. And we also have an income tax secured bonds, which um, is backed by the income taxes, both the individual and business income taxes. And for each of those, we have at least one rating agency that um, has rated each of those bonds triple A. There is, um something in the question is, I believe I may have heard incorrectly. How many months of reserve does DC currently have? Two months. So we have two months of um, um, what we call working capital. So when I went through the, the list of all the different areas where uh, we, you know, the different boxes or um, pots where we put the money, um, the, the one that we refer to as the locally or federally mandated reserves, we have 60 days of, um, um, I guess, expenses in, in, that, in those pots of money. And that it's about 16 and two thirds of the expenditure budget. 
Thank you. I want to say a little bit more there because people, some people are critical that we have so much money set aside in the reserves. Uh, Fitzroy used the term working capital. Uh, much of that money that's in the reserves gets spent during the course of the year and replenished. It depends upon cash flow, which is not even. We don't get the same amount of, you know, the, the billions of dollars that we get in revenues don't come in evenly by week or even by month. And so there are peaks and troughs and that revenue flow and uh, the reserves are used to even that out. Uh, the reserves have been used extensively for a lot of COVID relief. And um, actually when we had the hearing on the uh, annual financial report, um, the cash flow reserve, 50% of that has been spent so far this year. It'll be replenished and the contingency which is another reserve fund has a $317 million at the start of the year and currently has $45, $46 million in it. Um, so the reserves get used quite a bit during the year. Mm -hmm. I, uh, that's a really um, good point because as the chairman says, sometimes people hear that we have the reserve and there's this sense that it's just sitting there. And you know, as I mentioned in my um, presentation, it's, you know, we call it working capital because it's really important in the day-to-day -day functioning and running of the government. So it's not just some pots of money just that's just sitting there. The next question is in the chat, is in the question and answer and shared again. So I think we should ask this question. How will the budget office identify bloat in the budget that can go towards adding additional funding to the budget to allow for more robust modernization plan for our Ward 8 schools? All right, I guess that's for me. <laughs> so this would be identifying bloat in the capital budget. The capital budget is about one, I, I believe that the FY22 capital budget is something like $1.2 billion. It's a lot of money. So what we end up doing is when we get the budget, we look at the current year spending on all of these different um, capital projects to see how the money is flowing out the door. Like, are they actually spending the money that has been budgeted for these different capital projects? And if it isn't, that gives us the opportunity to push the money around and like push it back, excuse me, um, to, to reallocate it amongst the years. That frees up money for us. And then we look at what the uh, proposed capital budget is and um, you know, is, is something, is there too much for a particular program that has been, or excuse me, a particular project that has been uh, less before, or is there a particular project that is in the mayor's proposed budget, but we know that there's just no way that it's going to happen on that time schedule. So we can um, make modifications. And then sometimes we just defund particular capital projects. And, and we've done um, that as well. So anything, I mean, that's, you know, that's really how we identify money in the capital budget. Um, but then our school spending, which I believe has been, you know, mentioned before a few times, we have to follow this PACE Act, which is this law that um, sort of delineates the um, uh, sort of the different priorities for which schools we need to renovate next. And the council as a body tries to stay within the parameters of that act. I don't know where, I, I haven't looked at the list recently. Um, I would, um, but that's definitely something that we can pull and share with council member White or, or share with Dr. Reed um, to see where the various Ward 8 schools are on this list. They should be on there. They should be high. Um, and, but, but that's, you know, really how we do it. It's just looking at each individual project and trying to figure out if it's budgeted at the right level. And that does 
and it, and it does result in us finding um, funds. Wanda, any more? Um, I got one right here. If you want me to read it one, I can. Sure. Okay. This may seem like it is a art modernization plan, but wheelchair access is missing from some of the some of our schools. That's true, because that was an issue at um, Malcolm X, um, which we had to put money in the budget to fix. I know a grandmother whose grandson had to eliminate his uh this top two high schools because they did not have wheelchair accessibility, which is ADA compliant. Um, separate from other modernizations, a lack of wheelchair access seems like a violation. Uh, if that's the question, it's not a violation if the school has not had any renovation. That's not to say we shouldn't try to provide that accessibility. It becomes a violation of the law, therefore it's mandatory that when there is renovation, substantial renovation of a school building, that it has to be ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act compliant. But I do know there were some instances where we uh, put additional money in the budget to create a ramp or yeah. uh, put a small contract out to create yeah. access to the school. So, I so if the question to... is, are, should we do that? Yes. If the question is, are we breaking the law when we don't do it? Um, only if we don't do it with a school that's getting renovated. Or new. Yeah, which speaks to the importance of modernizing, renovating uh, our, our school buildings. Jane, like you was about to say something about that. Oh, no, I was just going to say there are pooled projects. So there definitely is money that is set aside in the capital budget for things like this. Um, okay. It's just a matter of, of, of how it's spent. Yeah. Yeah. Councilman, I do not see any additional questions in the chat or in the Q&A. Well, all right. Um, again, um, my email is twhite at dccouncil.us. We are taking community suggestions. Um, we will be speaking to other uh, local groups like ANCs, civic associations, faith-based institutions, organizations about different budget priorities to gather as much information as we can. Um, and it's, you know, the, the, the hardest thing to do is please everyone, but we fight very hard to ensure that we are uh, fighting for, I don't even wanna say fair share, but equity in the budget. And I wanna uh, thank uh, Director Lee, um, Jim Budolf, Chairman Mendelson, um, and my staff for, for joining us tonight. Also, Dr. Uh, Colleen Reed. Um, I think it's very important that we uh, have these type of conversations about uh, your tax dollars, how it's being spent or not being spent, what the process is. And I just want to thank you all for joining us tonight. If there's no other comments or questions, we're going to conclude this roundtable tonight. Thank you, guys. Council Be member, um, I believe the chairman has his hand up. You do? Oh, uh, I do, but I don't didn't mean to. Oh, okay. <laughs> don't worry I about it. Get him back with the many times he don't pay attention when somebody got their hand up. Stevie, he'll be fine. How, how did I get my hand up? Uh, I have no you idea. Saying? <laughs> thank you, Wanda. By the time you find it, Chad, I just lowered lower it for down. you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, guys. You all have a wonderful night. God bless. Yes, thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Good night, everyone. Thank everybody you. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you. All right, good night. Good night.